Hi guys, Dr. Ken Norberg here again <laughs> with another fireside deer hunting seminar. Interesting topic today. Something new is going on in our deer woods that you need to know about. I'm talking about a recent change, a big change, an important change that have whitetails made in their uh, in habits and behavior, changes that are actually making it much harder for us to hunt whitetails. <clears throat> I didn't realize it was going on. I, we ran into this kind of behavior in 2017, but I thought it was because of the hip deep snow we had on opening day that year. And uh, you'll understand why in a little bit. But this year, they, they did the same thing. And we only had two to four inches of snow on the ground. Now that is something else. That means something else important is going on in the woods. This new change that's affecting our ability to take whitetails is just beginning here. But it, 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 the reason it's beginning is because we have lots of wolves, and I'll explain that a little bit. If you've got wolves in your state, <laughs> and boy, there's a lot of them now, from Montana to Maine and New York, and, or Wolf-like animals like koi dogs, those kind of things, uh, pestering your deer. Deer and that can even include uh, western Texas, west Texas. <laughs> uh, this is something you need to watch. And, and uh, it's kind of important to know what to do about this new change in whitetail habits and behavior. One of the things I've learned about uh, studying habits and behavior of whitetails for 50 years now, it's been 50 years, hard to believe, uh, that they are really adaptable animals. And they proved it. Uh, a lot of you guys here, younger guys, you don't know the, the, the huge adaptations whitetails have made before you start hunting. That's some big ones, like uh, back in the 80s when uh, Doe and Estrus Lorsens came out, and I've mentioned this before, why, my goodness, they were, they were dynamite for attracting bucks to stand sites, those type of Lorsens. But today, they're not, not so dynamite. Uh, they'll still attract younger bucks, but those older guys, they become really smart about this. They won't be attracted to a source of that scent as long as human scents are accompanying them. And don't fool yourself, no matter what you try to do to prevent your sense from traveling with those dull and type pheromones, airborne pheromones, you can't keep human sense from going there either, and you should know that by now. So you always have to be really paying attention to wind direction and, and where the source of the scent is. But anyway, white tails have learned to not be, uh, the bucks have, are not suckers for that type of lure anymore. And you still get one once in a while, it works, but not like it was in the old days, like back in the 80s, that was something, that was amazing. Same with tree stands, you know, uh, uh, portable tree stands came out in the 80s, well, a little bit before, but it got to be bigger and bigger, and I was one of the people who was, who was uh, telling people at seminars all over the country, if you want to get big bucks, you've got to be in a tree, in a tree stand. <laughs> so. Boy, that was dynamite too. All my kids, gee, we had deer all around our stands, were only six feet up. And all my kids, when they during their first years of hunting, took nice bucks. Uh, some on the wall. One was the second biggest one ever taken by a Nordburn, <laughs> by my oldest daughter. But it was amazing back then. Back in the 1970s, uh, older bucks paid no attention to our permanent tree stands. Here's an example of a, where a buck made a ground scrape after that permanent tree stand was erected. But today, whitetails are stand smart, especially older bucks. They're, they're really smart about tree stands, so things have changed. They adapted to us. And so, one of the things we had to learn to do, us Nordberg, see, we had all that good hunting with tree stands and buck sense, uh, lure sense. And when that started to fall away, well, gee, what are we going to do now? And so that's that's when we started uh, trying different things and hunting different hunting techniques and basing their effectiveness on how many bucks we saw 
that were didn't know we were there. They were unsuspecting bucks within 50 yards. It didn't matter if we got them or not. We, if, we, if we saw bucks that close, we didn't know we were there. We were onto something because it was getting to be really hard to see many of those animals using our old traditional hunting methods, including tree stand hunting. That's old traditional now. Uh, as long as I've known whitetails, one of the things they did every winter, usually about the beginning of the last week in December, our whitetails would congregate, they would travel to wintering areas. Some of them would travel 30 miles to get to a traditional wintering area where they've learned to go when they were fawns and yearlings and have been doing it ever since. Our wintering areas in here in Minnesota, uh, some of them are small, they only uh, accommodate a couple dozen deer, and some of them are very large. The largest one I know of is about 18 miles long and about two, three miles wide, and there's usually anywhere from 400 to 600 deer in that wintering area every winter. They migrate to wintering areas. Now they have several reasons for going there. Usually the wintering area has really good cover, uh, protect them from heavy snowfall and frigid winds. Uh, uh, getting out of the wind is kind of important, especially when, <laughs> when temperatures are really low, like here in Minneapolis this morning, where the wind chill was 28 below zero. That's pretty low. And then we're going to have lots of snow, a foot of snow in the next couple of days. So that's Minnesota for you. But they would go there for protection from this kind of weather. Uh, the does especially need that kind of protection. If, if they're exposed to frigid winds for a long period of time, really low temperatures, they usually lose their fawns, the fawns that, are, that, that start growing after they were bred in November. They'll lose them. Not many does will have fawns in the spring and that kind of weather. So they need protection. But maybe more important than that, well, as important, well, there's food. Uh, these wintering areas have, have uh, reliable food sources, uh, browse plants, and maybe white cedar boughs, which they can live on all winter. Uh, and we have lots of those in northern Minnesota. But red osiers and uh, maples, all kinds of good browse. But when the snow gets deep, those kind of those browse plants get buried in the snow. And, uh, uh, they're hard to find, and uh, there's no, uh, food becomes scarce usually later in winter by the time you get into the end of February, into the March, and even April. Uh, whitetails are suffering from lack of nutrition. Uh, some of them, when it's really bad, if, especially if winter is extra long, uh, we, we can have huge losses of whitetails due to starvation. But more important than anything, if these wearing areas are places are, where large numbers of whitetails, you have to have large numbers, you have to have herds to be able to do this. But the whitetails in those wearing areas will make a maze of deer trails all through the area. It doesn't matter if the snow is only a foot deep or it's five feet deep. You get a large number of deer keeping walking on all these trails within that, within that wearing area. It's really important. They keep the trails open. Not only to get to food sources, but this is a protective thing when their where their wintering areas are invaded by wolf packs. Now, when deer herd like that, herd like that, they have uh, three advantages. One is uh, uh, in a group like that, they have more eyes, ears, and nose and white tails, and those are sensitive organs. Even eyes, they, they may not see you when you're in. You're sitting very still in good color, but uh, they have excellent eyes. And the big buck glass fall showed me they can even see you 400 yards away real quick, right away if you move, you're move, you moving when they see you. But anyway, uh, they have those sensitive eyes. It makes it very hard for any wolves to get close to the wintering area uh, without the deer knowing. Second reason is when, it, when, uh, when those deer see you, uh, wolves approaching. They start snorting, and it's really funny. I, my wife and I have seen this happen several times in one of the, a big deer yard where some wolves, some deer over here start snorting because here come some wolves that are coming down this trip. Uh, pretty soon there's wolves, there's deer way over there snorting and deer way over there snorting and be just a matter of minutes, maybe seconds. All of the deer in this wintering area have been alerted 
to the fact that something dangerous is coming, all this snorting going on. So they're they're ready now, and they're starting to do things like hiding and you know trying to keep from being seen and freezing and cover and all that kind of thing. And another one, uh, uh, and the good noses, you know, uh, that's only good for wolves approaching from upwind. So that's a little more limited, but it sure serves. They sure have really sensitive noses and hearing. Hearing is their best defense because they can hear in every direction. <laughs> it, that, it's not limited to one one direction. Well, but anyway, there's that, and then uh, spreading the alarm. And the other thing, you know, like I was saying, is they form these trails. No matter how deep the snow is, trails they can use to run on when the wolves are come to the, like their winter area. So those three, three things are there. And so, like I said, deer have learned that. They've been doing that for a long time, maybe centuries. But changing, <laughs> but not being in the same place twice in a row, that's something new. <laughs> well, anyway. Now, you know, during the summer, like in my uh, study area, uh, our, we have two, two adult wolves, uh, alpha male and alpha female, that live it, within my study area. They den in that study area, one portion of the northwest of where we used to camp, and uh, produce pups there. And usually in the summer, because that's the only, spring, summer, and fall, those are the only wolves in that study area, just those two. Now, just because they're just two of them doesn't mean they're not hard on deer numbers because those two wolves, two wolves to feed their young, I suppose, and themselves, prey on fawns, and they're awfully good at them. And between mid and May, November 1st, they will normally kill about three or four fawns every year. And there are lots of ways we've proven that, but the big one is that during that period of time, practically every wolf dropping you find in that area contains deer air and fawn teeth, which are unworn and unstained, they're pure white, and uh, fawn-sized dew claws, and hoofs in wolf droppings. Those are all signs of fawns that have been killed. So they've done most of the, they do most of the damage to deer numbers during spring, summer, and fall. And not till about November 8th do wolves come from other places, probably related, maybe puffs from former years come back to that area and they form a pack. And this happens all over the North Country. They form packs that can be six, seven, eight uh, adult wolves under the direction of the alpha male and female and, and, and uh, pups that uh, alpha male and female have. And they have big packs and they hunt cooperatively. You know, they set up drives and stands even. They sure do. That's a, a common way for our wolves to take whitetails where we hunt. But at any rate, uh, w when whitetails are in these wintering areas, they're vulnerable to being hunted by these wolf packs. And wolf packs can come in and kill a lot of deer. And, uh, but the point is, uh, in a wintering area with these trails kept open by a lot of use walking on them, the, 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 the fittest of the whitetails in the herd, the ones that are most healthy, uh, have been good, they have gotten a, the, enough food to, to last them to, through until spring, but the healthiest of deer, this is where survival of the fittest really works in nature. Uh, they, they'll be able to run on these trails. They may not go miles in any one direction, but they can go miles within, back and forth and around in that in that maze of trails within the wintering area and outrun wolves. Normally a, a healthy, uh, a, a mature white, a healthy whitetail that's two and a half years of age or older can outrun a wolf. They can go almost 10 miles an hour faster than a wolf. Most of the time wolves have to settle for deer that are vulnerable for some reason. They're slow because they're young or they're old. Like older bucks, they, they get any buck that's still six and a half years of age uh, going into winter, it will probably not survive that winter. Wolves are young during their seventh winter almost every time. I've only known one deer to survive to seven and a half in our study area in 30 years. Wolves get them now.
Well, here uh, we found while we we're scouting, we found the remains of a buck. That probably was killed during the winter by wolves because it's been chewed on quite a bit. Uh, muzzle part here, they love to chew on that. The uh, nose and nasal cavities, it's full of cartilage, nose. It's all been chewed off. But this was a good sized buck. Look at this button here where the antler was attached at one time. It's an uh, inch and a quarter across. And you know that button that sticks out around the edge of the of the base of an antler, that would get it out even further. So this was a good sized buck. And there's further evidence of that. Look at see how it's been all chewed up here. Parts of the skull all chewed up. And zygomatic arches are gone. Most of, most of the front part of it is gone. But here's part of the maxilla, the upper jaw of the deer. It would have been on the right side. And look at the teeth, how worn they are. See? They're really flat way down here and partly black. I would guess this buck was probably, oh, he could have been anywhere from three and a half. I, I think more like four and a half to six and a half years of age. He could have been a six and a half year old buck in his last winter and the wolves finally got him. But uh, he was a good sized buck, this one. And this is all that remains. That is typical what you find. Uh, they, it's funny the wolves didn't chew this up and swallow the teeth as well. They often find the teeth of, of, uh, of whitetails in the droppings of uh, wolves. Especially fawns. They eat the fawns' teeth and the hoofs and everything. <laughs> Although the teeth don't uh, digest, they come out in the droppings as well as the hoofs and dew claws. But they often eat those. But. Looks like not much left of this deer. There's a couple of vertebrae there from the neck and uh, and this part of the skull. And uh, but it's typical wolf kill type bones <laughs> fragments that you find that wolves after wolves have taken the deer. So, but that that's kind of old. It was probably killed last winter. Yeah, yeah. This is a normal thing. And but anyway, these trails in the winter here provide the fittest of a deer to, to uh, escape these wolf packs from the end of Okay, well normally, you know, like I said, the, our white tails don't migrate to wearing areas until the beginning of the last week in November, just before Christmas or about Christmas time. I, I've hunted deer and studied deer quite a few times in late December over the years. You know, before Christmas, yeah, the deer are all over in their usual places and they come there after Christmas and there's not to no deer anywhere, no fresh track. Because they, our deer in our study area travel about, they only have to go about three, four miles to get to their winter area, uh, west of my study area. But they're gone, they're gone for the winter. And so, <laughs> anyway, back in 2017, when we had deep, deep snow in our, in our hunting area, uh, our deer were not moving. My, well, it was understandable with all that snow. Uh, it was way before the time, you know, in November, or early November, before they would be going to wintering areas. So they were kind of caught there in this really deep snow before it was time to migrate to a wintering area. And, uh, and they were really scarce. We can understand why they weren't moving much. Normally, you know, during the normal year when you get six, seven, eight inches, maybe a foot of snow during the deer season, uh, you won't see any deer around for 24 hours. And finally on the second night after such a storm, cracks all over the like the deer are reestablishing all their trails by walking on them. But they're actually, oh, we gotta keep this one going and that one going and there'll be tracks all over the place. And that's normal. Well, when we had hip this snow, that didn't happen in two days. It was several days before deer started moving. And finally when they did, and we started finding their tracks, we discovered they were in bunches in certain places, hidden little areas in the woods there. It looked to me, I remember when I found one next to the last day of our hunting season, found a place where a bunch of them had been. I, I just couldn't believe it. We, had, we weren't seeing deer, we were having a hard time. We did get our four that year, by the way. But anyway, 
we got back, uh, I got into this one area because I was lost for a while. I was in a snowstorm, snow coming down, and I was actually lost for a little while. I, I knew how to get unlost. I wasn't worried about that. But I got into an area I had never seen before in all the years. We studied deer there and hunted there. And it was full of tracks, fresh tracks all over the place. And it looked like hundreds, maybe thousands of tracks in this one area. And it was just, after the tough season we had, I couldn't believe, look at this, this is amazing. Well, I hunted there uh, that day, I stayed there quite a while, and I went back the next morning. No deer, they were gone. Well, I thought, well, I probably, uh, they probably caught me the first time I walked into this area, and then they're, you know, they didn't come back for that reason, they weren't going to feed them that day. And browse, they were thinking on browse. So I let it go at that, but we thought it was just the snow. Well, this year, like I said earlier, they did it. They started doing the very same thing in, in early November with only two to four inches of snow. Now that's different. I mean, you couldn't blame it on the snow. What in the world's going on here? And you know, it was really weird, you know. Well, we did well this last season for good reasons. Uh, we were keying, uh, because we had snow, it was made it easier to key on big bucks, you know, finding bigger tracks in the four inch class to find dominant breeding bucks. And we were finding dull urine, spotted with blood, which means that dough that made that urine was in heat. And boy, we were keying on those things, those two things. Now, you, you just don't wander all over the woods to find those things. We have our, you know, our special ways of finding those without, uh, without uh, spooking all the deer away in, in the area and causing them to, uh, to uh, leave the area for the rest of the hunting season. We don't do it that way, but, but that's not what I'm talking about here. But we, we discovered that not all of the deer were doing this. There were some. And the, the groups, the, the deer that were making, uh, uh, becoming congregated in groups, uh, herds, uh, I, they were looked. They seemed to be like a couple dozen in a herd in a lot of places. But when you, they would feed in a certain area, and there would be tracks, all oh, fresh tracks. You come out there and you're heading to a stand site in the morning, and you, you got your flashlight on. You're walking on your trail. You got marked with tacks, so you know where you're going in the dark. Going to a stand site somewhere, and all of a sudden, holy cow! What is this? There's fresh tracks everywhere. It, we, we kept finding those. Uh, here on the first graphic, this is, is a set of tracks of a typical doe family, a fawn and yearling with its mother. And uh, normally, well, in years past, when we'd find fresh tracks in a feeding area, this is about it. If it's a big feeding area, we might see some more on the other end. But this year, this is the kind of tracks we were finding. There are a great number of deer feeding in the same area. So it's quite a difference, and you can imagine how excited we'd get when we'd find tracks like this. And you know, when you find a feeding area, or an area next to a feeding area, full of tracks like that, you, th you, you think you found Bonanza. Well, like, oh, this is going to be something. Well, all, almost all of those deer uh, were either uh, does, maternal does with young, and the young included uh, fawns and, and yearlings. Yearlings stay with their mothers all through their yearling year. So it was that class of deer that were farming herds. And so you just didn't see any big tracks where these, where all these fresh hoof prints were, except if one of those does, or maybe two even, was in heat. And when, if, if the one was in heat, that buck could be dragging his horse from track to track in the snow, you know, and just two or four in the snow. That buck is under the influence of thermal. And you find this urine there and it's got blood spots in it. That doe's in heat. Well, then, that's <laughs> something to work on when, during the hunting scene, boy. If you want to get a dominant brain buck, you just can't hardly do better than you would do if you could key on those kind of signs alone. Nothing else. Boy, just key on those. And I won't tell you how to camp, but, but a lot of times these groups didn't have 
tracks of bucks, uh, even though sometimes we found uh, doe urine spotted with blood, but we knew that was going to be an attraction. But what was really weird about them, you know, like I say, when you find it, oh, a deer bonanza, oh, it's going to be great. So, yeah, instead of going to where you're going to go, let's see, that wind's coming from that way, and I'm going to check for sure, oh, yeah, it's coming that way. Uh, I want to be over there somewhere. And there's that line of air range over there. I think I'll just get over there right now, in the dark here, you know, I'm doing this. And we all have our stools on our back. Then we get in there. Oh, here's a good spot. Here's a bunch of younger evergreens. I can sit down in here. I can put my back against that trunk of that big balsam right there or that big aspen and sit back and pull my head in it. Now, uh, wait for first light. And when the first light comes, we look. There's going to be all kinds of deer out here. <laughs> so, anyway. When, cause, yeah, normally, if, if you stumble into a place like that where a lot of deer are feeding right now and you're seeing the tracks, it's almost too late already for, to hunt those deer that day. It's almost, they know, it's almost certain they know you're there. Here you are, and if, here you go with your flashlight or over without it, and, you, and they see you move over to this area and sit on over there, they're going to move out of that area in the dark before it even gets to be first light. And they're not going to come back that day. No way. In the past, whenever we find a feeding area with fresh veneer signs, we normally would start hunting there right now, especially if it had anything to do with the, uh, expecting a big buck to be there. Or we'd, we'd plan to hunt there later in the same day, going back there and hunt in the afternoon. Or if we find the signs late in the day, we plan to be there early in the morning. So a lot of times when we found that, we, we knew that. You know, it, it wasn't convenient to do that. It wasn't heavily wooded or whatever. And uh, so we would plan to go back there later in the day. I'm going to go back around 1 o'clock and they're all bedded somewhere. And I'm going to hunt there this afternoon. Or, well, then we find that on the way back to camp in the evening. They come, holy cow, you know. And there, this area right over here where they went, it's just a really good feeding area, good of the brow, full of the browse plants that our white tails feed on the whole time. So I'm going to come back in the morning. We get back to camp and check the wind, what the wind direction is going to be on our weather radio. They look at the map and say, well, the best way to get there without them deer knowing is to go on this trail over this way and come in through the back here, all that heavy cover in there, and get close to the edge over there on that side, on the downwind side or crosswind side, whichever works, I sit out and I want to see deer there. Well, it never worked. Because what those deer were doing was changing, they, they would never feed in the same place twice. Every time they fed, it, twice a day or early in the morning, they fed somewhere in the morning, they didn't come back there anymore. They fed him, they didn't come back there in the morning. Yeah. They were feeding somewhere else during the next feeding period. Not coming back. And they would come back for days even. And then all of a sudden, one day when you're giving up on it, here they do <laughs> all these tracks and they catch you off guard. So we learned early not to be full, <laughs> but finding these big patches where all these deer tracks were. I mean, they looked so great. They said, how could you not hunt them? Unless one of those does is in heat and if you find her urine, it's got blood spots in. Or you, you see bigger tracks of a buck and he's dragging his hoofs and track. Then maybe you should go back there. Maybe that doe will come back there, but maybe not. Got all excited, we find all these tracks and we, we hunt there during the very next whitetail feeding period. Well, we've been, we found out fairly soon that we were a half day late <laughs> and uh, we're in the wrong place. We're wasting our time there already. We need to be somewhere else. We need to be where those deer are feeding right now. But it won't be right here. So that's one of the things we got.
But what they're doing today, changing feeding areas every feeding period. But why are they doing that? <laughs> well, it's not a far cry from what they do in the wintertime. Here comes winter, and gee, the wolves have formed big packs now. And pretty soon we're going to be trapped in an area where there's a lot by deep snow, and, and we're going to be weakened by starvation. And, even some of them dying from starvation. The little plants that can't reach as high as the other deer when the only food is all way up there in tree branches. Yeah, that, that kind of thing. Our white tails know these kind of things are going to happen. But what they're doing here is, is creating that maze of trails in this winter area that, they, that the healthy of us can use to escape these wolves. They do that then. Well, what's happened there, you know, since we started hunting and studying whitetails there, wolf numbers in that area have quadrupled. And there's lots, I've talked about before, lots of ways that we know they have quadrupled. And uh, this, so the area is just full of wolves. And their numbers have been increasing year by year by year because they've been, they've been protected by the Endangered Species Act all this time. And people, and we, we find it when wolves would finally been turned over to the state for, for the state to uh, take care of. Then somebody gets an injunction in court and they stop all the proceedings and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And so wolves were not huge in number in 1990. Today they're huge in number in 1990. Deer numbers weren't bad in that area. Today they're bad. Five to six per square mile in that whole arrowhead region of northeast Minnesota, it's like that. Well, those wolves are hungry <laughs> and they don't have as many deer or moose. They've been eating moose as well. They don't have many, as many of them for food as they used to have. And so they're it. our wolves in the old days, they had it only at night. You'd hear them, you'd hear them howling at sunset. And then at night when they're pursuing deer or or a moose at night. Uh, they'd be howling and barking when they're, when they're pursuing them. Uh, but we hardly ever saw them during the day. That was rare. But in the last several years now, uh, our wolves have been pursuing uh, deer and moose during the day as well as at night. We had a lot of problems with wolves this year. They were prowling our camps at night, howling. Uh, we had 11 guys in camp this year, wild guys and girls. Uh, two of my uh, daughter-in-laws hunted with us this year, and that was nice to see them. They were real nice to have them. One of them was hunting on the hillside, not, maybe 150 yards from uh, the tent that she was staying with by, with her husband. And, one of my other sons and her wife and a son and and anyway, um, wolf showed up and probably all oh, it was about 75 yards away. I saw it when I went up there and checked on that when I was heading to another stand site. She it was about 75 yards when these wolves opened up howling like they do at sunset. <laughs> and, Boy, did she take off that. And then she took off. I, I'll bet she didn't touch the ground three times getting back to camp. It scared the daylights out of her, and I can understand that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times during the hunting season, we'll have our hair standing on end because the wolves hauling very close to it where we are. Um, and you hear them hauling and close, and, and we've had them try to pirate deer from our deer camp, the deer bucks we have hanging behind camp. And the last several years, we get up in the morning, there's wolf tracks real close to our tents every day. And you're going out to a stand side, there's wolf tracks, fresh wolf tracks. Well, there's one was over here, one over here, and then the four get together up ahead, and they go a little bit, and they keep going. It's kind of crazy. Uh, we have never had so, uh, so many fresh wolf tracks in our deer hunting area. Uh, that were just made during daylight hours as we've had this past few years. Uh, they've been really a lot of wolves and fewer and fewer deer. Well, those deer are desperate and the wolves are desperate too. You know, that, that's why they're hunting day and night now to try to find enough food. And that's why 
they're not being as uh, successful at raising young. Uh, that's one of the things that happens when, when wolves aren't getting enough food, they won't raise as many young. And that's been happening. Lots of things like that. But anyway, so our deer have finally decided that they have to start farming herds early to try to get to them. First time winter come, I don't know. You know, they might be doing this in spring and summer. I don't know if they're doing that in spring and summer. I'm going to be anxious to get spend some time this next spring and summer and up there in there, there to find out if this is what's happening. Uh, I've seen this happening in Texas, in the Panhandle area. Not only with whitetails, but with mule deer. There they're pestered by coyotes. And they complain there are the coyote numbers have gotten out of hand. And, that kind of thing. So deer start, they're herded up. They don't even have snow on the ground. They're already herded up as in bunches like that. And you guys in West Texas, you'll, you know it. This is what you've been seeing now for quite a few years. This is happening there just as well. I've seen it in South Carolina as well. Now, anyway, uh, but they're herded early. But that, that's one thing, that's a normal thing. That's a consequence of just too many wolves and not enough deer for the wolves to eat. And so the deer are, are wanting to survive so that they're farming herds earlier than they would. That, that's a natural, they do that. So and to, to, uh, to be able to survive uh, uh, depredation by wolves all through the winter, they, they, this is normal behavior. But they're starting it earlier or before they even migrate to wintering areas. Well, that really puts, <laughs> and, and the worst part of it is, this is new, don't feed in the same place twice in a row. You know, I, I talked to hunters after the season that hunt in that area, some of them five, six miles away from where we hunt. They were seeing the same thing. And I talked to some other hunters that hunt, uh, hunters that hunt east of them, and they were seeing the same thing. Uh, tra tracks, of, all kinds of tracks a bunch of deer feeding in different areas and they were coming back. They were feeding somewhere else every time they, they, they left their beds to feed. That's new. And that's horrible <laughs> for us hunters. Like us guys, you know, it's been our practice for years is to, is to key on areas where, where does are feeding. If we don't have snow, then we'll just go with doe tracks and doe droppings at known feeding areas. If there's fresh ones there, this place to hunt and hope that maybe one of the does we see out there in one of these feeding areas uh, one morning or evening is in heat. And if it is, the big dominant buck area is going to be with her and we're going to get a big buck. And that might sound like, gee, that's kind of, you know, a lot of hard work. But by golly, it works. Sooner or later, and a lot of times sooner, I've taken several within 15 minutes after the season started, opening money, doing that. And so, king on areas where does feed is <laughs> really an important thing, you know? And, uh, they, you know, all deer don't feed together at the same place, and especially when feeding, when breeding's going on, about the only big buck around there is the dominant breeding buck. He chased all the other ones out of his, out of his square mile home range, breeding range. And some of them sneak back once in a while, and he chased them away again. And then yearling bucks come back all the time, and he's chasing them away. But most of the time, about the only way, the only practical way to take bigger, older bucks during the hunting season is the key on where does feed. But now, that <laughs> if they keep doing this, and I bet they will, because I don't see where there's going to be any change in numbers of wolves and deer. A lot of the two that are there together, those, that combination of numbers is not going to change much for a long time. This is going to be an ingrained thing, you know. And you know, it's funny, it, took, it wasn't until the 1940s that the whitetails started invading farm areas. Yeah, back then, uh, all of northeastern Minnesota, the half, wooded area was deer country. And all the southwestern half was prairie farm country. And uh, it didn't take more than about, oh, two decades for whitetails to adapt to living in farm areas. Today, there's more deer in the farm area in that southeast, southwestern half than there is in the northern forest areas. And maybe they made that change. 
Well, this is a change. And it's a change that not only helps them to survive wolves, but hunters. Because how in the world can you know where those does are, that those her little herds are going to feed tomorrow morning or later today? Kind of hard to do. So that puts the onus on us hunters, you know. It means that we got to know where all the feeding areas are. You know, if it's browse, you got to know where the browse areas are. When you're out there scouting in early fall and they aren't even eating brown browse, you still got to be able to say, this is an area where a lot of deer fed on browse last year. So that's one of those spots I want to keep an eye on this year. So but what, we're, what we're trying to do is make sure we got all these feed, browse areas figured out in our hunting area before this coming season, where they are. We're going to mark them on maps. Here's, here's where they are. And then if we find early, and I bet, you know, it's almost certain, the deer have formed herds by the time this season started, well then, uh, we're going to have to try to outguess them because it'll be a mistake to talk where they where you find all these tracks. You've got to be somewhere where they haven't gone yet. And let's say you come to a place and here's all these tracks now. They're going to come back unless You've gotten to be too aggressive, you know, hunting on foot all the time or making drives. Those deer are all going to abandon that area, that square mile or whatever. But if you're a stand hunter, they're going to stay. They'll stay put. But you've you got to keep moving, you see, from one spot, one feeding area to the other when this is going on in Michigan or Pennsylvania or New York or New Hampshire, Maine. When you see this, when you see bunches like this farming, and it's going to happen, you watch and see. If you haven't seen it yet, you're going to. That's in your future. When you see that happen, don't be fooled by all these tracks in the feeding area. I mean, it's hard to ignore that. What you got to be is where they haven't been yet. But if they come back, it's not uncommon that they'll be back in five days. That, that's been the best number in our country now for a while. Five. You go to, you have a spot where you thought, oh, this is a dynamite spot to take a big buck and you go there up in the morning and oh, something happens. Uh, uh, the weather screws it up, the wind direction's wrong, or moose are <laughs> laying down the area. Uh, when white tails sure don't like moose. And anyway, there's a lot of things that can, that can screw up that, your plants. And if that's the case, you go there, and this should have been good. Oh, I'm really, just going to go back to camp for lunch. Really, save it for five days, and don't go back there to, for five days. And then, and then you want that wind direction to be right, so you can get there from downwind or crosswind as well. And you want to be able to get there through heavy cover, so they don't see you as easily. But anyway, five days. If you keep doing that, you know, it, a square mile is only so big. If you're hunting a big buck at a square mile and you're scan hunting him, he's going to stay there. Well, you're going to catch him sooner or later, like I say, maybe opening morning, uh, maybe Tuesday afternoon or noon, or uh, maybe Saturday morning, something like that. But don't give up on him. <laughs> and uh, one of those times you're going to be there when uh, the first light, the deer start getting light, here's that herd dog in front of you. That would be so fun. And when, it, when you got a bunch like that, the odds that, one or, that more than one is going to be in heat are pretty good. And uh, boy, two of them in heat in a place like that, or wherever they are, it can be a real attraction to dominant breeding buck. Well, all bucks for that matter, but primarily the dominant breeding because he's been keeping all those other bucks away. So if you want, if you want to be a regularly successful buck hunter, you know, in the future, or even a doe hunter nowadays, you gotta be moving. You can't just stay in one place the whole season. That is so crazy. And I don't care if you got a food plot or you got all the things that clover, it doesn't matter what you've done. If you just sit there and play, you see, your odds are not good. And you're dealing with the deer that knows better than any other deer how to find you. Big bucks, 
bucks, three and a half to six and a half years of age today are stands marked deer all over America. And you can't fool them by sitting there in the same place uh, for day after day. That's just, yeah, once they've got you, and most time they get you before you even know it, you know. But you're going to find out, you're going to learn they, they've done it because you don't see them. Where's the big buck? They got all the pictures of on your trail cam. And if the big buck in the trail cam out there in your food plot, where is that buck? He'll be some, he'll be there, but not within 100 yards or so of where you're sitting. He'll be all over in the rest of this, in this hunting and breeding area. So, this new thing is, this is new. It, it's really new. It's another new adaptation made by White House. And it's being made because of wolves. But because it is, and because we're hunters too, like wolves are, we're, we're hunters also, it's affecting us. And it's affecting us in this way. And uh, so if things aren't working out where you're hunting, and if you're finding places you're going to hunt, see a lot of tracks. Remember what I've been talking about here. This is what's going on. And, that, and now you know what to do about it. So that's why this is an interesting talk today. One of the things I was always impressed by when I'd find large numbers of tracks like that, and especially after I, we learned that those deer aren't going to feed here again during the next uh, feeding hours, the, the doe that's leading this herd is one smart deer. <laughs> I, I know it was that way in Texas. Uh, when I see a dozen deer together, and normally they were, there was no antlers except maybe some, uh, a, year, a couple of yearling bucks with antlers. That would be the only antlers we'd see in that bunch. But there was always one doe in those groups who was the, the leader. She was the most dominant doe, and she's the one that decided where they're going to feed and when they're going to feed us. The, the, the groups, the does that are feeding these groups we're seeing up where we hunt are really smart does. And especially when that doe has decided that We'll feed, we'll feed here now, this morning, but not anymore today. We'll do it once. And like my son John has mentioned that, you know, wherever they feed, there's going to be a lot of odors. You know, there's a lot of deer in this area. I, some animal like a wolf comes by and says, oh man, there's all kinds of deer been here on a different, different smelling deer and fawns and yearlings and bucks and whatnot. A lot of deer, this is probably pretty exciting to them too. And probably, you know, does never been in the same place twice, especially in that little flood, because they don't want fawn odors to build up and in any one spot and be attractive to predators. So they, they move around in deep grass where they're hard to see, you have to practically step on them. But don't do that. And this way, doe bedding areas are much larger than buck bedding areas because they keep moving their young around in there. So that so, probably, I imagine a doe, uh, that dominant doe in the bunch, and, and I, boy, those dominant bulls are tough on the other deer. They don't do what they want to do. They get kicked pretty smartly. <laughs> you do it at one or else you're going to chase out of here. But anyway, that's a smart doe, uh, and uh, it has a lot to do, uh, this probably helps bucks survive as well, because the bucks are, bucks are being always, you know, all through, oh, last time, like October, and each of those two, uh, each of those three breeding periods, two week long breeding periods until early January, uh, there's going to be does and heat, and uh, uh, so the bucks are being attracted to them, and uh, the does doing this, it makes it better, and better for the bucks, although it doesn't seem like it worked that way <laughs> this last year with my son John in the woods. But, uh, that's a smart doe that's, that's causing this change. And maybe it's always been that way. I don't know. You know, bucks in the wilds uh, seldom live over seven years. Most of them don't get through, don't survive their seventh winter. Even in the deep south, it's that way. Uh, but does can live up to 14 years in the wilds. They live much longer. They don't wear themselves out and there's all this breeding related customs of whitetails. And imagine a doe, uh, a dominant doe who's been around 
you know, 10, 12 years. That's a smart animal. It'd be pretty hard to outfox one like that. Now, they can be really smart. And uh, uh, this is why most of the antlers do you take are spawns or yearlings. Whitetails, there's talk about whitetails forming herds early in the season. It's been going on, you know, I saw this year after year now, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, for 18 years. Uh, not all that, the last years especially. When, when you get out there in the morning or evening, there's always a bunch. They're in the little herds, maybe 10, 11, 12 deer in a bunch. And that was just normal. And I, you know, it, it's, how could that be? Well, in their case, more than likely, the deer were doing that to give them a better chance of surviving attacks by large predators, the coyotes in that, area, in that case. That way to protect their ponds, maybe, you know, larger groups. And, uh, but whatever, uh, that's going on. And, uh, you know, it took whitetails about two decades to get used to being hunted by people in trees. So it might take a couple of decades for whitetails to get this kind of behavior really holding down really well. And uh, so you guys sitting in the tree stands, uh, you're just getting left in the lurch <laughs> if you stay there. So, but anyway, the way to be mobile and, and be successful at it is discussed in great detail in, in my book. You know, I'm not just trying to explain this book. No. I, I'm not trying to, I don't want to be rich or famous or anything, but I'm just trying to help people to be more successful hunters and especially be more successful at taking a hold of bucks. And uh, I don't make a lot of money on this. Uh, but I wish every hunter in this country had this book so that they can enjoy the kind of buck hunting my sons that I've been trying for now for 30 years. And you can do it though. And uh, so, sometimes. No, it, when you got this book, that's a small book, that's three pumps. Uh, it's going to take a while to learn what's in there. It'll take you years, really. You know, especially when you get a stool and you start working on a stool and you're thinking, oh, this isn't going to work and all that kind of thing. If you're doing things just right, it's going to work. There's a lot of precautions involved. But I want you to be as, as, as successful as that. So, good that. Now, one more thing. It's important for me, <laughs> I've said it before, for you, uh, if, I wanna, if I'm going to keep giving you these seminars, and I've got lots more, uh, I wish you would hook that red button down there and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And also that thumbs up one, that's important too. It's ways for YouTube to figure out whether I should be or continue bringing seminars to you. So be sure to do that, will you? I want to keep talking to you about deer hunting. So with that, thanks a lot, guys, and I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.